When considering the history of music in the Roman Catholic Church, it is obvious that Gregorian chant is identified as the music of her liturgical prayer. It is true that other kinds of music can be used appropriately during the liturgy, so says Vatican II, and many musical compositions of the modern church have very little to do with the musical modes and structures of chant. Throughout the church's history, however, it is only chant that has been claimed as the music proper to the Roman church. Gregorian chant is the only sacred music that the church has systematically codified and intentionally passed on from century to century. This tradition has given Gregorian chant pride of place. We may ask again, however, what is it about chant that gives it pride of place? For what reasons has it been passed on from century to century? Has it simply been a matter of taste? Here are three reasons why chant has been given the privilege of pride of place and is deservedly the sacred music that identifies with the Roman Catholic Church. Reason number one, Gregorian chant is fundamentally traditional. The word traditional is often misunderstood. Quite frequently, when one hears the word traditional, one takes it to mean old-fashioned or of the past. But by referring to Gregorian chant as traditional here, I do not mean old. What I mean is that chant is given to us. Here, I could replace the word traditional with the word given or with the phrase handed on. That is what the word tradere means, to hand on. Every bit of the Mass is traditional. It is not something that we recreate every Sunday out of thin air. Consider how a sacred musician goes about planning music for a liturgy. When he or she plans music, they first consult what has been handed on to them. They ask, what season of the liturgical year is it? Is it a feast? Which Sunday is it? They read the scriptural texts associated with that particular liturgy, and they think about for what part of Mass a certain piece of music is being used. All of these aspects of the liturgy have been handed on to us. We are always receiving the liturgy. Perhaps more than anything, Chant is received music, and each and every piece of it serves a particular and important function in the liturgy. To understand this more thoroughly, let us consider the two parts of the Mass for which chant has been written, the Mass proper and the Mass ordinary. The Mass proper is made up of the texts of the Mass that change according to the feast or commemoration. This includes the collects, the scriptural readings, the preface, the post-communion prayer, and others. The portions of the proper for which individual chants have been composed are the introit, gradual, alleluia, offertory, and communion. These chants are often simply referred to as the propers. And just as the scriptural readings are different for each Mass, the text and music of the propers are different for each Mass. Even amongst themselves, the chanted propers serve different purposes. The introit, offertory, and communion chants are all meant to accompany the processions of the Mass. The introit accompanies the procession of the clergy into the sanctuary at the beginning of Mass. The offertory accompanies the procession of the gifts to the altar at the beginning of the liturgy of the Eucharist. And the communion accompanies the procession of the faithful to receive Holy Communion. The gradual and Alleluia chants, on the other hand, are meant to serve as responses to the scriptural readings. The gradual is sung in response to the first reading, and the Alleluia is sung in anticipation of the gospel. 
Since the purpose of each of these chants is different, their musical composition and format are also different. For example, the introit and the communion chants are sung before and after the chanting of psalm verses. These chants on their own are not particularly complicated. The gradual, however, is sung only once, with no recitation of psalm verses, and usually possesses a more decorated and complicated character than the introit and communion. The ordinary of the Mass is made up of much simpler chants than the Mass proper. The ordinary contains all the parts of the Mass that are not changeable, the parts that stay the same from one Mass to another. The ordinary chants include the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, and the Agnus Dei. The simplicity of many of the ordinary chants is likely a testimony to their being sung by the congregation as a whole during the Mass. The chant settings of the ordinary found in today's chant books were collected in the 19th century. There are 18 different settings of the ordinary for various seasons and feasts. From looking at the Mass proper and the Mass ordinary, we see that each piece of chant has a particular meaning in the liturgy. Gregorian chant has been handed on with this purpose in mind. The chants, containing particular truths of the liturgy, are passed on from one generation of the faithful to the next, so that God may be praised across time and space by the universal body of Christ. This passing on of Gregorian chant can be likened to the church's passing on of her teachings. Each new generation does not come up with a new doctrine on the Trinity or a new definition of the Incarnation. Though theologians are always plunging more deeply into these mysteries and will always have new things to say about them, they are only able to speak of the mysteries because the mysteries have been handed on to them by tradition. Tradition shows us that the mysteries of faith are a gift from God, a gift that is ever greater than us. Deep calls on deep, and there is always more to learn, more to pray about when it comes to the mysteries of the faith. But because they are a gift, they belong to us, so we receive with joy what we have not yet come to understand. The chants of the church are also this kind of gift. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul says, The Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. It is beautiful to think of Gregorian chant as the groanings, the sighs of the Holy Spirit, given to us because we know not how to pray as we should. God must first give to us the prayers that we offer him. The tradition of Gregorian chant symbolizes this reality. When I sing chant, the prayer of the Holy Spirit becomes my own prayer, and my vocation as a sacred musician is to simply hand on what has been handed on to me. It is essential for all sacred music to possess this gift-like quality. In this sense, it must all be traditional, and I don't mean old. I mean handed on. Just like the liturgy, the doctrine and the practices the, the, of the church are given to us by tradition, so is the sacred music of our faith. Gregorian chant has pride of place because it has been handed on to us by tradition. Reason number two that Gregorian chant has pride of place. Gregorian chant is mostly comprised of psalmody. At the Mass, we are accustomed to hearing a psalm usually in only one place, after the first reading in the form of a responsorial psalm. What we rarely hear are the introit, offertory, and communion antiphons that are assigned to each Sunday and comprised mostly of psalmody. 
Here is an example of the introit, or entrance antiphon, for the seventh Sunday of Easter. Lord, hear my voice when I call to you. My heart has prompted me to seek your face. I seek it, Lord. Do not hide from me. Alleluia. That is Psalm 26. And here is another entrance antiphon from the Feast of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Christ. The Lord fed his people with the finest wheat and honey. Their hunger was satisfied. Psalm 80. What one usually hears today during the opening procession at Mass is a hymn, which, according to the directives of the general instruction of the Roman Missal, can stand in place of the proper antiphons at the entrance, offertory, and communion processions. So, rather than hearing the previously mentioned entrance antiphon on the seventh Sunday of Easter, we'll often hear, Alleluia, sing to Jesus, or the strife is o'er. The result of this has been that while we enjoy singing these well-known hymns, we miss the divinely inspired texts of the Psalms that the church has given to us for each liturgy. Why is psalmody so important? In his book, A New Song for the Lord, Pope Benedict XVI points out that the Psalter is the hymnal of the Bible. The summons to sing a new song was very important for the first Christians. For them, it meant the singing and praying of the Psalms with a new level of interpretation. After the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, the psalms were sung as hymns to Christ, the new David, and the true author of the psalms. The Holy Father writes, In the Old Testament, its hymns, the psalms, had been considered to be the songs of David. This meant for Christians that these hymns had risen from the heart of the real David, Christ, in the early church, the psalms are prayed and sung as hymns to Christ. Christ himself thus becomes the choir director, who teaches us the new song and gives the church the tone and the way in which she can praise God appropriately and blend into the heavenly liturgy. The psalms, then, are a gift to the church. In a concrete way, they are the new song given to us by the inspired word of God so that we are able to give him the praise he is due. Finding its identity in psalmody, Gregorian chant takes up this new song. It is based in the Psalter, the hymnal of the scriptures, and is comprised of hymns to Christ coming from the heart of Christ. This is also why we can say that the Spirit intercedes for us through Gregorian chant. Since the words of the Psalms are the words of Christ, and because all scripture is in divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, we praise God with his own word when we sing Gregorian chant. The singing of scriptural texts, particularly the words of the Psalms, is essential to authentic Catholic worship. It is because the Psalms are at the heart of Gregorian chant that the church has given it pride of place. Reason number three, Gregorian chant has pride of place because it possesses a distinctive sacred sound. In 1903, Pope Pius X called for a renewal of sacred music in his motu proprio, Trale Solicitudini. He had seen that in many places, a sense of the sacred had been lost in the liturgy. An example of this was the use of opera-like music at Mass. He requested that sacred music possess the qualities proper to the liturgy, the first of which he said is sanctity. The word sacred means set apart. It means preserved for the highest things. This is a good way to describe Gregorian chant. It is unambiguously sacred. It is analyzed according to a system of musical modes, a system that is foreign to our modern ear and gives it a sound unlike other music that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. When chant is heard, 
it is immediately identified with Catholic worship. Think of old movies you may have seen that make a reference to the Mass, a monastery, or something overtly Catholic. There is often Gregorian chant in the background. Chant is, in a sense, the native tongue of Catholic church music. It has an obvious identity, and when you hear it, you know to whom it belongs and where it belongs. Indeed, Pius X said that Gregorian chant possesses the necessary qualities of sacred music in the highest degree and held it up as the supreme model for all sacred music. Chant imitates the qualities proper to the liturgy, which is an entrance into the sanctuary of the divine. Gregorian chant has been given pride of place because it properly expresses the sacred nature of the liturgy. So, the traditional nature of chant, its basis in psalmody, and its unambiguous sacred sound are the qualities that give it pride of place in the liturgy. These are qualities that go beyond a matter of taste because they are, as Pius X said, qualities proper to the liturgy. Because Gregorian chant embodies these qualities, sacred musicians must hold it in esteem when making decisions about what music they will offer at the liturgy. The best way to esteem Gregorian chant is to use it. In the following segment, I will offer some suggestions for effective ways of using chant on the parish level.